There's a world in which a group of mountain gorillas in Rwanda might one day be able to pay for their own protection. This conservation effort may sound far-fetched, as it involves a new financial model with an AI-powered digital wallet and data that's provided by the gorillas themselves, as well as the people who live and work around them. But the man behind this project has brought other unlikely ideas to life. He invented the concept of blood delivery by drone, which has proved transformational in some places with poor infrastructure. If you get online and you look, you can see that between the nostrils of the gorilla and the eyebrow is what we call a nose print, which is really like a thumbprint for a human. It's unique to each animal, and it was very easy for us from an AI point of view to create individual identity of those animals to which we can attach a wallet. I'm Jennifer Strong, and this is Shift. Now here on the steering column is a device called Autocruise. You simply set the speed you want. Self-driving robo-taxis are already on the road in two years. the disc rotates, a mirror reflects the light in the way that depends on how the signal was recorded. This is the 100 terabyte action I present to you Electro, the Mono Man. Ladies and gentlemen. I would say that one of my greatest skills is my ability to interact with you. This episode, it's the latest installment of our oral history project. I was sitting in a village in Africa and the village had a very, very old tree. And I literally been thinking a lot about this question of digital identity. I thought the, the tree is probably not going to survive in the next five years. It's been there for 500 years. Clearly it has an economic value. I knew from my background in economics that the tree was obviously worth a hundred times more alive than it would be dead. But how to make that happen? So that was that was my kind of epiphany. My name is uh, Jonathan Lejard, co-founder and CEO of Tehanu, which is a group using artificial intelligence and other technologies to allow the circular flow of money and data from humans to non-humans. The government of Rwanda has done a really, really good job with protecting the species. Rwandan mountain gorillas, they, they are doing really well. They're growing in numbers. They have a lower level of infant mortality, um, lower stress levels, and all of that can be observed. So anyway, we had all of this data. We went and did a financial valuation of Rwandan mountain gorillas, which I think is probably the most advanced financial valuation that anybody has done of a wild animal ever to date. And we determined that when you add up the carbon value, the existence value, the aesthetic value, you end up with a valuation of about 3.4 million US dollars per individual gorilla, which is about $1.4 billion for the Rwandan population of mountain gorillas. The point here is not in any way to suggest that mountain gorillas are a commodity. Of course not. Absolutely, 100%, not the intention. The point is to show that $1.4 billion is equivalent to 10% of Rwanda's annual GDP, if you could lodge that perceived value, it's not a real value, it's a perceived value, if you could put that onto the central bank reserves of Rwanda, maybe there is a way of tokenizing on that value to 3 or 4% a year, and that would actually pay for the entire protection of the mountain gorillas. So I think that's a really important starting point because the species that we want to work with all are providing services of different kinds into the human economy, services which are not paid for 
by humans, have never been paid for by humans, often are not even acknowledged by humans. And if we acknowledge that as a starting point in the discussion, we can actually admit that many species deserve to hold money and in a very limited way participate in the human market economy, you know, a precursor. But in terms of the practical, technical side, the, the principle, I think, is, is simple across species and across different taxa. So it doesn't matter whether you're an animal, if you're a tree, if you're a bat, if you're an insect colony, the principle is the same. You get given a digital identity which is agreed upon and can be verified. And we can say, I know you're a customer, right? So we, we use in our group the term KYG for know your gorilla, you know? So our purpose was to basically to get, create the KYG, which actually, funnily enough, our finance guys in the group think our KYG is far in advance of any, you know, high street banks, <laughs> KYC. But that's an aside. But the, so the KYG is basically saying that each individual animal has their own identity. Now, there, there are only a minority of species for which it is needed and required that an individual of that species will have their own identity. But obviously, with a species like mountain gorillas, of which if we take the population in Congo and Uganda together, we're talking about 1,100 animals. It's not a very large number of specimens, you know. So for us, it was obvious from the beginning that this species deserved to have individual digital wallets. For us, we, we took all the historical data. We deployed 72 camera traps within the range of the national park. And we focused on one particular family of mountain gorillas, which was called the Quitunda family and there, there were 22 individuals in that family. So each one of those gorillas got a digital wallet. Thanks to the hard work of rangers and trackers, we are able like daily to verify the presence of these mountain gorillas to, to verify their continued existence. We then assigned nominal amounts of money. It's not important in this pilot that large amounts of money crossing the species divide, but we allocated nominal amounts of money to the wallets and we built APIs, which then allowed the digital proxy, or I hesitate to say digital twin, because that would be too ambitious for what, what is needed and what we're actually doing. But let's say just the digital proxy of the, of the gorilla, and they were able then to make mobile money payments to the trackers, the rangers, veterinarians, and people in the local community who are providing services to the gorillas. Even that is pretty cool, <laughs> I would say, but, but for us, what was even more exciting was really to build that AI system, which is trying to create AI-inferred interests for the animals. So you, you really have this ability, um, and we're going to try it out with several other species next year, but we really have the ability to scrape the corpus of human knowledge on a given species and to add in metadata, to add in human interviews, and then from that to build kind of guidelines on the interests of the species. So obviously, in the, for the foreseeable future, I think humans will be the ones who will be acting. And we have to just look at this as an AI co-pilot, you know. But already we could see, even though I would say we're at the Sesame Street level of where we will be in 10 years' time, but already we could see that the AI was better than the human in selecting some of the interests of the animals. It was more dispassionate, 
it was more creative. Is that the right word? You know, simply because a lot of human knowledge exists in silos, veterinary science doesn't speak to animal behavioral science. Conservation work doesn't speak to development. The humans are really fantastic at a lot of things, but we're not actually great at breaking down the silos of knowledge. And, and when we think about other species and the really limited resources they have, so an interest has to be actionable, has to be ethical, has to be verifiable. And probably it has to be divisible in a way that can be incentivized with a mobile money payment. So for example, with the mountain gorillas, sometimes poachers come into the volcanoes, national park, laying down snares to catch small antelope. So they're, they're not trying to poach the gorillas, to be clear. They're trying to poach for protein, which they can sell in the marketplace. But gorillas are very curious and they often put their hands or their feet inside these snares and then the snares sometimes cause them to lose a hand or a foot or sometimes even to die of sepsis. So naturally the gorillas will pay a ranger to identify and remove the snare, you know. But we don't have time in this discussion to go through all of the interests, but I think there are over 500 which were listed. And obviously in our group, we have uh, some of the top primatologists who have decades of experience working with great apes, and they were really staggered actually by what a relatively simple AI approach could deliver, you know? So we're, we're pretty optimistic that when we get to species like bats, which I'm particularly excited about, yeah, and which humans have not really given much thought to the interests of those animals, even though they're supporting our ecosystem to probably a trillion dollar level. Now we, we are at that point where we, broadly speaking, the gig economy, you know, whether we talk about Uber or Bolt or other parts of the gig economy, that similar architecture could be extended to nature and services provided to other species. And here, crucially, this is a really important point, Jennifer, we're, we're really thinking about unprotected species in unprotected places. We're not talking about lions and giraffes and elephants, you know, which are living inside national parks, which are already fenced in and well protected by armed rangers. No, we're, we're, we're thinking about species that people don't think about every day. N little animals, trees, plants, forms of bats, birds, eventually even like insect colonies, you know. But the principle is always the same, which is if you can observe it reliably over time, you can attach a value to it. If you can attach a value to it, it's worth working out what to spend that value on. And uh, uh, agents in the community using often just the cheap Android phones I was talking about can perform a simple service. The service might be just to record that species is still there and existing, right? Uh, that might be the only service that's required, but it might be that they need to make a little bit more space for them. They need to provide some kind of intervention for that species. The system can become more dynamic over time. But, you know, for, for my group, the point is to prove this idea to such a scale that financial instruments can actually start to be sensibly applied to it, you know. So we, we can raise money within the AI space, within the philanthropic space, possibly even within the VC space to get to that, you know, $150, $200 million level. Beyond that, you really do need to have financial flows which are rational and, and where money is being applied because it is sensible to do so, you know? And, and there can be a whole other range of arguments as to why that. I mean, obviously I can make ethical arguments. I personally would make aesthetic and spiritual arguments, but I, I don't think aesthetic and spiritual arguments are going to cut, <laughs> cut it with a VC. So in the end, 
it really is about like economic services, which many species are providing. Or you you take a, a longer range view and you say the point is to get into the 22nd century with more or less the same life forms on the planet that we have today, despite the fact that we're putting them through the mill for the next decades. And this is the price that we have to pay for putting them through the mill, especially to provide triage services for them to help them get through what is going to be a very tricky time. This episode was produced by me and Emma Silicons and mixed by Garrett Lang with original music from him and Jacob Gorski. Thanks for listening. I'm Jennifer Strong.